Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Joey Kolchinski, CEO and founder of One Vision Resources. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Joey. Uh, founded One Vision back in uh, 2008. <clears throat> but my introduction to this industry was 15 years ago in 2001 as a, as a high schooler. And my first clients were wealthy individuals, and they asked me to support their technology in their homes. And um, over the next several years, I, I built up a uh, tech support business in the Boston area, uh, catering to these wealthy families. And they taught me a few things. They taught me to respond instantly, they taught me to be available 24-7, and they taught me to have a high level of emotional intelligence, because the first 15 minutes of a support request is more of a human issue than it is a technical issue, um, as I'm sure many of you might know. And uh, I built up a pretty successful recurring revenue support business. By the end of 2015, we had $100,000 coming in every month just for tech support. Fixed fee tech support, we were there to manage their smart home systems. And at the end of last year, we took everything that we had learned and we turned around and spun up a smart home call center. And so now we provide white label tech support instantly 24 seven to residential integrators in their name. So we pick up the phone and we say, Acme Integration, Joey speaking. So the client thinks that they're speaking to their integrator. And then we use all that data and we go and sell RMR and service plans to their end users on their behalf. So how does this relate to you guys as, as uh, security companies? Um, many of you, I think, are probably familiar with ADT, Pulse, and Alarm.com. And if you might be installing those in the homes, you might be experiencing, or if you haven't, I suspect you will soon, that the consumer's appetite for a lot of this technology actually quickly expands beyond what ADT Pulse and Alarm.com can actually provide. And so as soon as they start introducing hardware that's outside of those ecosystems, ADT and Alarm.com will no longer support that hardware. Right? They, won't, they won't provide the full comprehensive support experience that they were providing before. And so if you want to maintain that relationship with that consumer, you too will likely need to consider becoming some form of smart home integrator. And when that happens, your rate limiting factor will likely be support. And so if you are to venture down that path, then I'm here to partner with you and make sure that's not a rate limiting factor for you so that you can go do that successfully. Because if you talk to any of the guys downstairs who have been doing this for many years, they'll tell you that now it's coming back around and, and causing problems for them because support has become a real big pain in the butt. But support is ultimately the key to RMR. I've got a few slides, at least on the smart home space, I should say, right? So without support, you can't really make any RMR possible in the smart home space. So I get a couple slides, and then I'll open it up to some Q&A if any of you have some questions. Um, so the premise behind everything we do is that people generally expect a fast response. Now, the data point across the whole industry, when you just survey all of America, you get about a third of people want a response in less than an hour. But at our market level, when you've got people paying tens of thousands of dollars for some form of smart home technology, we tend to find that all of them expect a fast response. And there's three problems to that. Number one, customers assume that this is a right and not a billable service. When it comes to technology, they don't expect to have to pay for you to be there to pick up the phone instantly. And you can thank the Apple store for that, right? You buy a computer, and for the next several years, you can walk into any Apple store, if you live in New York 24-7 on Fifth Ave, and get awesome free basic support practically anytime you want. Another one is providing this service is really expensive because it requires reserve bandwidth. I think you guys fully appreciate that. You effectively need to build up a call center in order to provide support instantly 24 seven. And the third one is that even basic tech support today requires some of the most trained technicians you have. You can't just throw a call center, uh, an answering service at this. And so if you speak with some of the residential integrators downstairs, they'll tell you, I have to put my most advanced, trained, uh, experienced support tech on the phone in order to ask the right questions and provide the right level of support in a moment of need for a client. That's a lot of lost opportunity, and that's really expensive. So when we speak with integrators, we always want to understand, what is your focus? Are you trying to improve the service experience? 
which if you're going to be entering the smart home space, you will need to do, you'll need to focus on that. Because tech support is a really critical component to a successful smart home implementation. Are you trying to gain operational efficiency? So you're not gonna want your own guys having to deal with instant 24 seven support. That's pretty inefficient. And do you wanna build sustainable revenue? For you, I know that you are all in the business of building up sustainable recurring revenue. So we do these things. We provide instant basic support 24 seven. We improve your efficiency by providing trained technicians in a cost effective manner. So my only job is to focus on hiring the best possible effectively Apple Store geniuses, and I then infuse them with three months more of training, and I convert them from IT support people to emotionally intelligent smart home people. And then we work with you to provide monitoring, and we build your RMR for you. And when I say monitoring, I don't mean monitoring of security systems. It's not the business I'm in. I mean monitoring the health and status of all of the technology in the home, regardless of what brand it is. We're brand agnostic. And so as soon as those things go down, we're following up with your clients and providing active support to them. And so this is how it works. There's triage. When a call comes in, we immediately ask questions, document symptoms, understand the problem. There's basic support. We diagnose, offer simple workarounds, maybe reboot an outlet remotely. And then there's advanced support. And so if we can't solve a problem after basic support, it gets passed on to advanced support. And that's your team. You guys have the trucks, you have the techs, you go in the house and you do advanced support. And the problem that you're going to encounter, if you haven't already, is that people expect this instantly at no charge. The first two things on the left, let me say that again, are expected instantly at no charge. That's the Apple Store. That's the Apple Store effect. The nice thing, though, is that if you do give them that instantly, then they are likely willing to wait and will then pay for advanced support. But you have to first pick up the phone and respond to that email instantly at no charge and help them solve the problem. So what we're offering to do is to take those first two things off your back, do it really, really well, more efficiently than you can probably do it, and then rely on you for your in-person relationships and your trucks and your team to go do advanced support. So that concludes my presentation. I'd love to take some questions if you guys have any. Any? I've got one, Joey. Great. Basic level. Um, AV support, let's talk about maybe multi-room audio system and a home theater stack. I think most of the security integrators here aren't going really far beyond that. What kind of costs are we looking at at the wholesale level? What sort of pricing to the consumer? Sure. So our costs are structured in two ways. Uh, one is we charge a per fee, it's a, it's a fixed monthly fee based on event volume, support volume. And uh, depending on your volume, it's about 30 to $40 per event, per support event. Uh, and we are finding that we're solving a majority of tech support issues without having to go to your team. And these issues might be quick five minute phone calls, and they might be several hours over the course of a weekend working with a client trying to figure out some weird little issue. Regardless of what it is, it's 30 to $40 per event, but it's ultimately a fixed monthly fee based on your average call volume. Uh, Minimum price there is $1,000 a month. The second component is RMR generation. So we're out there actively marketing and selling RMR to your clients, which, let me tell you, is a completely different beast than selling monitoring services for security systems. Everybody understands monitoring in a security system. They tend to get it. It's implicit within society today. Tech support, nobody has an implicit understanding of that. I joined the board of IHEGI two years ago. They're a smart home monitoring company, and I watched how they introduced monitoring to this industry, the smart home industry. And the smart home industry really struggled trying to sell monitoring. And what it takes is a paywall conversion. We have to train your clients to appreciate that they're gonna get instant 24 seven awesome support, but now they're gonna pay for maybe faster truck rolls for tech support, right? It's just a TV that's broken. No one needs you to show up same day or next day unless they're willing to pay for it, right? Nobody's, nobody's gonna expect it unless they're, unless they're gonna pay for it. And then additionally, they'll pay for smart home monitoring on top of that. They will then pay for that, but only if you're providing instant awesome support for all the little things. Because the unfortunate thing we have in this industry, in the smart home space, is that quick, simple problems are expected to have quick, free solutions. That is the crux of this space, and that's what we're, that's what we're gonna solve. 
So we sell that RMR, and we then uh, take a portion of that revenue uh, when we sell and market that RMR to your clients. Joseph, question for you regarding system manufacturer. So I'm guessing there's probably 20 different access control, you know, mm -hmm. manufacturer products being used in this room, and NVRs, DVRs, yep. audio, security. There's another 10. So are you guys across all lines? We're across all lines. Um, we started with absolutely no help from the manufacturer side. No one helped us. No one gave us any information. But we were former integrators. We were pretty smart. We had learned this stuff. We knew it. And we had the systems in our offices, so we trained our teams on it. Without any of that help and without any system documentation to design, we are still solving two-thirds of the problems. And the reason why is because when you start responding instantly 24-7, your clients start to depend on you more for tech support, for the little things. Oh, I got this error message on my TV screen. OK, what does it say? Well, it says that my credit card's expired on Netflix. OK, I can walk you through to fix that. But it's amazing. When you give them an instant response, people actually want that. They crave a fast response, right? And they will start calling you more for it, which is good, because the stickier they are, the more addicted they are to you, the more likely we can sell recurring revenue. So we are now working with manufacturers, and they are starting to feed us more material, given that we're now managing tens of thousands of homes. And they're, they're participating in our training process to make sure that our team is more aware of the technology that's in the home. Yeah. Going back a little, um, you were mentioning a minimum or a maximum price if you, per month. What was that? I missed it. $1, the $1, minimum price to start with us is $1,000 a month. Okay. And 30 per incident? It's depending on your volume, it's 30 to $40 per event per incident. Um, and we can, I mean, mo most integrators who start with us are starting at the one to $3,000 level. And then as we build up RMR and we change the relationship with the client, the fees start going up. But at that point, you're now making recurring revenue on smart home support. Hey, Joey, can you give us an idea of what one of your hero customers in the custom integration space is experiencing in terms of take rates on these services, margin on the RMR, that sort of stuff? Sure. So uh, we have integrators that have been with us for a majority of this past year. And the feedback we've been getting, there's a couple anecdotes for you. Um, Number one, they found that now that they're providing this kind of service, their work-life balance for their employees has gone up. And so they're actually having people from the industry from around their area coming from competitors and asking to work for them because it solves a problem for uh, the health of their team. We've had their clients tell them, the owner of the company, oh my god, I just spoke with Chuck. Chuck's awesome. You've got to give him a raise. And that's us. Chuck's my guy. right? So those are the kinds of anecdotes that, that we have. We've been called out on the phone once for not actually, um, they said, hey, did you just join the team? And we got really red-faced. We were a little scared. Did we give something away? Did they somehow figure out that we weren't the company? And she said, you know, I call this company a lot. I call you guys a lot. But uh, this experience was awesome. Thank you. Right? Like, if you just started there, I hope they hire more of you. So that's the kind of experience that they get from an uh, experiential and a, a service delivery concept then they experience all the operating efficiencies and things of that nature. Um, and then RMR sales becomes a lot easier as well. Yep. How do you integrate back the call activity, the call resolution, and call information back into my CRM system? That's a great, a great question. So we actually uh, become your ticket management provider. So we spin up an entire web-based ticketing system that integrates with a majority of the CRMs that you likely have. Um, and all of the incidents will funnel through into there, especially as we start training your end users to start using this one phone number or one email address for support. And we provide, we do all of our service, we document everything that we do. You can see everything that we're doing, but you're not notified until we have to escalate something to you. And at that point, that's when the ticket's handed off to you and you, you take it from there. Um, but it's a web-based ticketing system that we use. Um, I'll just close by saying I, I feel really fortunate and lucky that I was able to actually sponsor Ron Callis of One Firefly to do this. Ron and I have actually worked together for many years. Um, and I think you guys will uh, just sit back and relax. You'll, you'll learn a, a bunch of neat things, neat things from him. But he's doing some interesting stuff on the marketing side, too. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to follow up. We'll be hanging around here uh, during and after lunch. Thank you. Thanks, Joey. OK, I need our. I need our lightning round um, folks to come on up to the stage. So this is our product lightning round. 
Um, we've got four manufacturers. Come on up and step on up to the stage. And I need you in order here, ConnectWise, IP Datatel, Perennial, and come on up to the stage. Don't be shy. <laughs> IP Datatel is coming up. Okay. So here's the way this works. The um, Come on up. IP Datatel, Perennial, and Resolution Products. So each of these folks is going to have a minute to uh, make, we call this the lightning round because they have a minute to tell you why they sh you should stop by and visit with them at the exhibit. If they don't get their message done in 60 seconds, there's going to be a thunderclap, okay? <laughs> so, Dexter, you've done this before. Yeah, you've yeah. seen it at least. Yeah, so yeah. you get us started. All right. All right. So, first of all, this is a very nice blue rug that they have on here. So if you haven't had this experience, please do. Um, so uh, ConnectWise. ConnectWise is a software company. We're headquartered out of Tampa, Florida. What Really where we came from is we actually had our own IT business about uh, 40 years ago. Uh, that opened up shop, and we had all of these problems, text not entering, uh, you know, not being able to track text, not being able to track our projects, manage our profitability, uh, do all of those things. So we actually ended up building a software program for ourselves, um, and over time, we started showing that off at conferences just like these, uh, and people started buying into it. So um, now today we have over 7,400 companies that use us, over 100,000 users of the software. We do everything from project management, service delivery, CRM, invoicing, and when we integrate with most accounting packages. Are there any ConnectWise users in the room? Yeah, all right, we got one and two, yeah. All right, so go ConnectWise. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Ryan McConnell. I'm Director of Business Development for IP Datatel. I'm also joined by uh, Todd Hokinson, our uh, Senior Vice President of Sales. Um, IP Datatel is a, a real technology company. I've actually been with the company uh, since day one, and uh, we've always been focused on uh, not only the manufacturing of the products, um, but also providing uh, interactive services such as security system control and home automation. Um, we, we provide our dealers uh, with a product and service that makes an ordinary alarm panel extraordinary while adding other devices such as lights, locks, and thermostats. Um, and the true value proposition resides uh, on our key bus connected devices, allowing for uploading and downloading, uh, access programming from the virtual keypad, uh, just like you're in the customer's home or business. Uh, so spend more time uh, selling and less time servicing. Uh, reduce your upfront costs, lower your attrition, and increase your RMR. And what's your booth number? Don't know. <laughs> look, look for it in the directory, or look for it in the floor plan. Okay, Lori. Hi, I'm Lori Salim. I'm with Sedona Office, and I'm here looking for people who are having a difficult time analyzing and managing their recurring revenue, or maybe people who are struggling with job costing or people who dread the end of the month because they simply don't have the detailed financial reporting that they need to run their businesses. These are just some of the things that Sedona Office offers. Sedona Office is the number one financial software for the security industry. Business owners, financial consultants, operation managers, all rely on Sedona Office to help them run and improve their businesses. I am in booth uh, 410, sorry I forgot it for a second there, and would love to talk to you more about Sedona Office, or if you're a current Sedona Office, please stop by so that we can talk about some of the new features that we have, our e-forms, time and attendance, and our dashboard and analytics. Just beat the lightning strike there. Here you go. Yeah, I got you a quick one. Here you go. At Resolution Products, we like to do things a little bit differently, so instead of me talking at you for a minute, I want to make this a little bit more interactive. Anybody here have a driver's license? Fantastic. Then oh, everyone, please shout out the answers. How many sides does a stop sign have? Eight. Very good. And what color is a stop sign? Red. Excellent. How many sides does a yield sign have? Three. What color is a yield sign? Isn't that interesting? Every time I do this, people say yellow, but they're not. They're red and white, and they have been for over 20 years. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that most of our colleagues and competitors in our industry are still seeing yellow yield signs. We are in a period of the fastest, most unprecedented change that the security industry has ever seen. If you are still installing the same things that you were doing five years ago or even two years ago, your yield signs might be the wrong color. Please come see us at Resolution Products, booth 1025. Find out how to make wireless work for you. Thank you, and thank you to all of our lightning round folks. And with that, I'd like to welcome our featured presenter to the stage, Ron Callis, CEO of One Firefly. Awesome. Thanks, John. Do you have the clicker? Clicker, clicker. All right. Guys, all right, audio is working. Very nice to be here. I'm a little less formal, so if you guys don't mind, I'm going to come down here with you guys. We're going to walk around and have some fun. First things first, I want to thank a number of uh, folks uh, here that I've spoken with in the last couple of weeks. They've helped me consolidate the messaging and the content, along with John and then Scott from SSI Magazine. So thank you ahead of time. I'm going to call on a number of you as we go over the next 30 to 40 minutes. And I'm going to ask you to speak at uh, various times. Let's see if the clicker is working here. Is it red? Oh, there we go. A little bit about me. I'm, my name is Ron Callis. I'm CEO of One Firefly. We are a digital marketing agency and content marketing agency based in South Florida. Majority of my team's in South Florida, but I have staff located uh, around the country. I've been in the CI space, uh, the custom integration space, for the last 17 years. Spent time at Lutron and Crestron, have a degree in mechanical engineering, and currently run my marketing agency that serves CI businesses and security businesses. I always like to help you understand you know, who I am as a person. This is, uh, I'm the uh, uh, husband to a beautiful wife, Daniele, and the father to a Vulcan named Maximus. This is uh, just a couple of days ago when we went trick-or-treating. Also in my free time, I'm an engineering uh, robotics mentor for a local inner city high school in Hollywood, Florida. And I, I spent a lot of time with those kids. We actually just recently uh, started that program four years ago, and we actually just won the Orlando Championship uh, just this past spring. So if you'd like to learn more about FIRST and the FIRST organization, please see me. So I, I want to start with this quote from Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn's a famous motivational speaker and entrepreneur. And the premise is, success is neither magical or mysterious. Success is the natural consequence of consistently applying basics and fundamentals. So the topics that I'm going to bring up for you uh, here over the next few minutes are the basics and the fundamentals. There's nothing that's terribly exotic that I'm going to talk to you about. But many of you, and, I, and, and if you've seen me speak before, I like to be interactive, so I'm going to ask you to raise your hand at certain times to you know, participate in this conversation. And so many of you are going to find that you may not be practicing all of these things all of the times. Okay? My goal for you today is that you walk away with something that you can implement immediately in your business when you get back from this conference. Now, I appreciate Scott helping me out with some data for, uh, from Security Sales and Integration Magazine. And now I'm going to get out my clicker here. So the, the question here at the top, this is from the July 2015 poll that many of you hopefully uh, participated in. Select the top five marketing tactics that generated the greatest number of leads for your company. And at the top of that list was websites. How many of you, raise your hand, would agree that that is where you get many of your leads from your website? Looks like uh, no one in this room participated in this poll. Well, there we go, different clicker. So the, the premise is you have different mechanisms that are bringing leads into your business. This is a very rudimentary sales funnel. Uh, the, the topics that we're going to talk about today are going to be some different types of lead funnels that can ultimately bring business into your company where you then would prospect or you would convert them into a prospect based on their likelihood to buy and then ultimately close them. So this is a very rudimentary graphic, but it sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. First of all, interesting statistic. 60% of web traffic is now coming from mobile. 
okay, so that you can see right around 2014, uh, mobile web traffic surpassed PC-based traffic, and all indications are that's going to continue to rise. Okay? This is, according to Comscore, mobile now represents 65% of digital media time, while PC is becoming a secondary touch point. So the premise is that your web presence for your company needs to accommodate this fact. If you look at April of 2015, why, why, uh, so I'll back up, why is this important? In, uh, it's important for a number of reasons. One, in April of 2015, Google made an algorithm change. You saw it published in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. It was called Mobilegeddon. Anyone re recall that happening? And what they did is they started penalizing your website for search traffic if your website is not deemed by Google mobile friendly. So that means if someone in your local marketplace is looking for an alarm contractor or somebody to install a surveillance system, if your website is not deemed mobile friendly, the other websites that are will show up above yours. And this has now been happening for almost the last year and a half. Okay? So one of the technology solutions that accommodates this or that solves this is a technology called mobile responsive design. The basic premise is that your website, the one asset, your one website, will auto-populate on different screen sizes automatically so that a better experience will be delivered on an iPad and a better experience will be automatically delivered on an iPhone but the necessity to have a mobile website or different website assets is now negated and the reason that's important is it had again it goes back to that topic we'll talk about a little bit search engine optimization so you want to put all of your content all of your images all of your energy into one asset and mobile responsive design enables you to do that. And this is, uh, uh, we actually went ahead and put this render in here. This is Guardian. This is their website, and this is their, the way that their uh, uh, website shows up on all these different platforms. Now, for you guys, I recommend, if you want, take a moment, pull out your iPhone, and type in your company website, and take a look at it. Okay? Please do this. If you see what looks like your website, your normal website you'd see on a PC, but you see that and it's simply very small and the font is very small and the images are very small, then your website is not mobile friendly. Okay, so this is a quick way that you guys can determine right now whether or not you're meeting this requirement. Call that more of an analog test. You can put it in there and you can see. Now if you want to be precise, you can in fact go to Google Go to google.com, and if you want to find this search, I've got the full search query here if you want to take a picture of this. Google has a mobile-friendly test. Okay, so you can go to Google. You can just type in mobile-friendly test. It'll be the first link that pops up. Okay, so if you have passed the mobile-friendly test, put a checkbox in your favor. If you have not, this is something you need to work on ASAP. Search engine optimization versus... PPC. Now, from the discussions I've had with some of you and looking at a lot of the data from this industry, many of you are putting the majority of your energy into PPC, AdWords campaigns through Googles and such. Now, search engine optimization, we'll call that strategic. Uh, one of the challenges of SEO is it takes time to take effect, right? It's also, there's, there's historically been a lot of smoke and mirrors around how it works, how do I get my company to show up in search. I'm going to put out there the supposition that, and we'll, we'll pull up a chart here in a few minutes that'll support this. Many of you are getting the majority of your business through referrals. So that referral, I suppose, is often going to Google to research you guys. They might be typing in your company name. They might be typing in the services you offer. They might be typing in the services plus the geographies you operate. Okay? So it is critical to show up in that search result and the alternatives are you can be up there in the paid ads and or you could be right below in organic. Now let me show you what that looks like. So here's an example. This is a real search result. Uh, uh, right up here, I typed in the term home access control, Northbrook, Illinois. Here you can see there's a paid result right up here. This is showing up as a result of Google AdWords. 
And right below this, you see organic results showing up natively from the website and natively from something called a blog. Now, I'm going to take a poll. This is part where it's interactive. When you guys do a search, let's say you're looking for a plumber or you're looking to buy a toaster and you type that into Google, how many of you automatically, now hold, hold your hands, automatically click on the ads at the top of the page? And I'm going to take a poll for those, those uh, results. And how many of you scroll a little bit past that to the stuff right below the ads and then would click on those results? How many of you automatically, first thing you do is click on the ads? No hand raises. How many of you, the first thing you click on would be right below that ad? Now, isn't that a very interesting juxtaposition? that the majority of you are spending money on paid ads in Google AdWords, yet I challenge you to go home, ask your friends, your family, your coworkers, the majority of you are let, yet looking for organic results. Isn't that interesting? Now, here's some even more interesting data. So we have Moz. Moz is a well-known online internet uh, marketing and software company. According to Moz, organic results receive 8.5 times more clicks. Paid ads receive one and a half times more conversions. Okay, so one and a half times more conversions. But if you combine those two statistics, I would challenge that organic is still better. Right? So if you're not currently implementing a targeted organic strategy, there's room for improvement. That's great news. So the reality is one is not better than the other. They are different. Pay-per-click can buy you instant gratification and instant showing up in results if you're willing to put enough money on those keywords. And SEO is going to buy you time. Or is going to buy you, uh, res I'm looking at the clock here to make sure I'm, I can talk. So making sure I'm on target here. So SEO, the, the best strategy for you guys is to do an integrated strategy combining pay-per-click strategies with SEO strategies. So my goal today is teach you one new SEO technique and one new pay-per-click technique, something you can take home and implement. First things first, a blog. A blog is the singular most powerful component of online SEO performance today on the Internet. There is nothing more powerful if you want to define how you show up in your local market. And I've talked to some of you, and you're in, uh, some of you are in one or two markets. Some of you, uh, uh, I think I was talking to Craig, uh, uh, and you were in uh, uh, 21 markets. Is that correct? From ADS? Oh, Bill? Yes. So, I mean, some of you are in many markets. So if you want to affect the way that you are showing up, a blog is the way to do it. Now, why a blog? Everyone's heard this word blog. Well, I don't blog. I don't read blogs. The fact is, a blog gives you many different components that when Google is crawling and indexing a website, there are many layers to a blog that are highly relevant to Google's algorithm. They are crawling your page title, your page description, your H1 tags, your aliases, your categories, your tags. Okay? They are looking, Google is now reading your content. Google is looking to make sure you're not overloading keywords and target phrases in your copy. If you overload it, they're going to penalize you. They want to make sure it's relevant, authentic content. Why? What is Google's product? aside from the driverless cars and the quadcopters and all the other alphabet soup. Their, their primary product is a search result. When we want to find something, what do we do? You go to Google, you pull out your phone, and you, you, you type in a search query. So if Google stopped delivering good results, what would we as the consumers of that product do? We'd find another solution. We'd find another search engine that would deliver us better results. So Google went through dramatic changes in their search algorithm from 2010 to 2015. It is from, if, if you look at the data, it's almost flatlined to hundreds and hundreds of changes back to flatline. Right now, we're actually in a steady state. There haven't been significant changes in a while, although there was a recent announcement. So Google needs to deliver us good results, and a blog is a powerful way to do that. 
Here's an example of what a blog on a website looks like. Uh, this is a client of ours up in Chicago. Protest, you can see the categories here, titles, subtitles, copy, and images, just so you can see what it looks like inside. Often you'll see it architected up into your uh, header, so it's a main menu item you can click on. Now, so I know many of you have blogs. I've, I've visited many of them uh, in preparation for this presentation. I didn't run across one blog that was properly architected. Okay, so simply being busy and writing content, putting it on a blog, I'm afraid is not good enough, although it's a really good step in the right direction. So there's a matter of writing great content that's targeted, but then also properly SEO configuring it. Now here's a really neat technique. Uh, I could spend an hour on this technique, but I'm just going to uh, brush through it right now. And that is for those of you that are serving or are serving multiple markets, you have multiple branches in multiple locations, uh, putting all of those geotag target phrases into one blog asset, frankly, could be overwhelming. Okay, it would be hard for the visitor to visit that page and frankly know what to do. So the technique, and my firm has been practicing this technique, it's very creative, you won't see this, I haven't seen this anywhere, it's a matter of actually architecting multiple blogs, geo-targeted blogs, ar architecting all of those into a web asset, and then within doing IP recognition, so when someone in that market clicks on blog, they actually only have their geo-referenced blog show up in the result. So they feel they're at home, they, and they're reading content, and they're reading about cities and neighborhoods and colloquial references to geography that they recognize. And you're getting to the top of search in all those ways. Very creative thing. It's worth uh, investigating uh, on your own if you want to balance out your pay-per-click with your SEO strategy. Now, if those of you that have in-house marketing uh, uh, folks or you've outsourced and you're working with local agencies, don't let them um, kind of put, put the, give you the, the smoke and mirror act. SEO specifically is hard data, it's quantitative, it's exact. There's no maybe, there's no woulda, shoulda, coulda. Show me the, show me the targets I want to perform for and show me how I'm performing on this frequency. And so this is an example of an SEO dashboard platform that we use, that we white label, but it is matter of fact. You define all of the ways, the products, the services, the brands, the people, the neighborhoods and the cities that you want to show up for in search you do the SEO effort on your website and your blog, and you load that into your software, and you monitor it, and you track it. And if, what, if you have some particular goals for products or services, and you want them to perform, and they are underperforming, you now know where you're at, so now you can take a look at uh, what's wrong or what you should do better or different. Okay, It is exact. Don't let anyone tell you differently. All right, this is our pay-per-click technique. How many of you in here currently have a significant Facebook pay-per-click strategy in play? That's what I thought. Good. So this will be new for some of you, hopefully. So why Facebook? Oh, my kids are on Facebook. My grandkids are on Facebook. My customers aren't on Facebook. I say, oh, yes, they are. So here's the data. So many of the social platforms are declining. Facebook is continuing to increase in size. So this is the data from Statista, an online uh, statistical uh, resource site. This is just for the U.S. and Canada. As of Q2 of this year, 226 million uh, active Facebook users. Number of Facebook users by age in the United States, okay, this is your millennials, you're 25 to 34, there's about 33 million on Facebook. 35 to 44, about, I'm going to help you out here, maybe about 25 million. 45 to 54, uh, uh, about 23 million, and so on and so forth. Okay? Average daily time spent on Facebook by adults, these are your customers, 22 minutes a day. 22, when you actually add children into this, that number goes to 59 minutes a day. So under 18, but just us, 22 minutes a day, right? Now, for those of you on your phone, 
What does this mean, Facebook advertising? I'll tell you, everyone can see it right now immediately. Open Facebook, go to your news feed, scroll down to your second post in your news feed. It'll be an ad. They've targeted you as an audience. So here's the power of Facebook advertising. Facebook knows everything about everybody. Facebook is big data. Facebook's business is big data. Facebook has 15,000 data points on you and everyone you're sitting beside. Because they have now leveraged all of that data for us as business owners to define the demographic profile or the avatar of the person that we want to be in front of, whether that's an influencer in the design build community or that's a customer that you're prospecting, you now can put your content and your message and your call to action in front of that targeted person. When you're looking at your newsfeed and right below the headline it says sponsored, somebody has picked you and they want to sell you something or they want to influence you in some way. Okay? When you talk about uh, cost, at the moment, Facebook is a tremendous value. Will that remain? I doubt it. But today, it is a fraction of the cost when you talk about, A, some of the, the, the KPIs that matter, uh, getting a number of impressions, right? But most importantly, what you guys care about and what I care about when I spend money on Facebook is how many actions am I getting that I want. And the conversion path that I often use when working with contractors is I want to drive traffic generally back to content on the website. Whether that's blog content, educational content, a squeeze page, a download, I want to get that traffic to my website. Facebook advertising is awesome for getting traffic. For I'm going to give you a, maybe a shocking number. For about a tenth the cost, one tenth, the cost of Google AdWords, you can get the equivalent amount of traffic on your website. Okay, and this is, when someone types in that search query into Google, uh, you don't know who they are or what they are. In Facebook, you can actually get in and specifically define it. I could teach a course for three hours on Facebook advertising. It is a deep reservoir of really interesting stuff. Another thing that you could do is I can understand your customer demographics. You can take your email list, you can import it into Facebook, you'll get about a 50% take rate, it'll match Facebook profiles with email addresses, and you now can get a full demographic snapshot of all your customers by simply having a corporate Facebook page. They'll give you that data. Now you say, well, I want to match that demographic profile, but I want to do it in a particular geography. You can now create lookalike audiences. So they'll match the demographic parameters, and now they'll create your lookalike audience, and now you can advertise to that target customer base. Facebook advertising, as you can tell, I'm excited. I've been involved with Facebook advertising since the day they launched it in 2013, 2012 or 13. It's really neat stuff, but often shunned, so if you do it, it's a good way to be different. All right, here's more data from SSI. How many of your companies and new prospects, uh, how are your company's new prospects lists generated? Customer referrals, it's actually a slight increase from 13 to 14, or 13 to 15 of 5%. So it's now 85% of you. So I get it, and I'm not going to propose that that's necessarily going to change. Okay, so what are some techniques that we could implement that some of your friends and leaders in this industry are practicing today? Let's look at them. So here you can see uh, loud security. Uh, it's John, right? Yeah, John, we didn't get a chance to talk, but I appreciate you emailing me back. Um, so here you can see loud security, and I went ahead and did a search for loud security in Google, and isn't this interesting? Loud security. Do oh, I think I'm getting feedback. Loud security. What do you get at the top of the search results? Review. Is it review, 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 review? Okay? That is why review sites are a necessary part of your marketing strategy. You do not want to be uh, uh, passive at this. You want to be proactive in driving reviews for your company. Why? Because when they're searching for you, it is generally going to page one of that search. 
So these are, based on some of the conversations I had, these are uh, some of the common review sites that matter. I, I think it's fair to say probably the, the top six review sites or platforms that matter. So what I'm going to show you now is a technique. I have Mark. Where's Mark? Mark's right over here. So I'm going to do my best uh, to state what Mark's doing, and then I'm going to have Mark speak for a, a word or two. Looks like we are, uh, I'm talking a little over, so I'll try to make it quick. Generally, Mark uh, has his sales team visit the customer two to five days after the visit. He verifies that that customer is very happy. He, it's only at that point does he ask for referrals, and at that point his sales team also asks his customers to go on the review site. And in fact, this is a card. Uh, uh, Mark was kind enough to snap a picture and uh, uh, email this over to me. And so he, in fact, is actively driving his customers to review, re review sites. Yeah, this is a fairly new initiative. Uh, it's coupled together with another um, initiative called Red Carpet Service Follow-Up. So the follow-up comes a few days after. A lot of, a, a lot of uh, folks have their installers do the customer walkthrough, which is great. We do the same thing. We find two to five days later, the customer doesn't re really remember most of what the installer reviewed. Uh, we also find that if they're unsatisfied, they're now able to voice that very soon. And if they're totally happy, we're going to give them a referral card and ask them to uh, give us a review as soon as possible. And uh, that's almost instantaneously changed our review uh, landscape. We, um, Put you guys in the driver's seat. It, it, the, the day we launched this, we had one of our sales reps mention, I had the deal done. We were ready to sign, and uh, she was search the, the client was searching on her phone and said, hey, you guys have some bad reviews. Let me think this over. And it, it was that uh, prominent. That was the that impetus to say, let's get well, on top of it. It was, we were launching this at the, at the very same moment, but yes, it was like, wow, this, uh, people care about reviews. Awesome. Thank you, Mark, for sharing. I'm going to keep us rocking and rolling. So here's an interesting process. We're going to get into CRM in just a moment, but you're going to see me tip it off here. Uh, this is a, an example of a process where you're staying on top of your customer satisfaction and driving reviews. Project is closed in the CRM. Okay, we, we client gave me money. They're my customer. Project is closed. Or the inst installation is closed. My bad. Installation is closed. Cust uh, project is complete. The client is sent an NPS survey. That's Net Promoter Score. That's where you ask your client one question: Will you? Uh, are you interested or willing to refer us to your friends and neighbors? Okay, so if, you're not, if you aren't familiar with NPS, write that down. It's a great way to, it's a great number, a KPI for you guys to watch to define your customer satisfaction. So client is sent an NPS score. The survey response is sent to all stakeholders. Now let me just give credit to who this is from. This is from Craig Lyers over at ADS. So I'm going to uh, survey response sent to all stakeholders. Staff is proactively resolves the problem. The tech gets it. The trainer gets it. The salesperson gets it. The branch manager gets it. Every person in that organization get that client's feedback. So if they are not 100% satisfied, it is immediately resolved. What do you think that does in terms of breeding a culture of happy, raving customers? You guys have told me and the industry that most of your, your new prospects come from referrals. So why not be on top of that and be proactive to make sure that every customer is 100% happy? Here you can see Craig, uh, Craig's quote. Craig, are you in the room? Craig, do you mind speaking about this process you implemented? And thank you for spending so much time with me. I don't think his mic's working. I think you characterized it pretty well, uh, just in terms of the way it works for us. It really has allowed all of the folks on our team to be focused on customer satisfaction um, because it's very visible to everybody within a branch operation. So all of our technicians are very focused and take uh, survey responses very, very personally, frankly. The other benefit that we see to this is that we can use in-house development efforts to take a positive score, a net promoter score of a 9 or a 10, and then proactively reach back out to that client and ask for that social review on Google Plus or Facebook or whatever, which goes back to your point. 
And in terms of this program, how long, Craig, have you had the seven referrals you now get your service for free program? So we've had that referral program in place for about eight years now. Um, and it has been, uh, it's been very, very popular for us because it's created this culture of consumers who become advocates for us. Awesome. Thank you, Craig, for sharing. That was great. All right, guys, more data from SSI. I'm going to keep us rolling here. Does your company track its leads? Now, I'm going to be honest. This completely surprised me. I expected actually much worse results, say, from the, uh, the resi side, right? So I guess they're downstairs. I expected that answer to be like 1%. But from this room, I expected this to be 80 90%. It boggles my mind when you're in a business where you need leads, you need to close those needs, you need to follow up. It's all about recurring revenue. So th this was uh, astounding for me. So what's the answer? Embrace the use of a CRM. Okay, so rapidly growing companies are embracing their CRM as a central element. These are some of the more common when I was having different conversations. These are some of the platforms uh, that I found you guys using. Uh, Sedona Office, I know the, the young lady was here, uh, she was just on stage, and uh, I believe it, Craig, that's the platform that you were operating on, is that correct? Or who was working on, who that I spoke to was working on a version of Sedona Office? Was that you, Craig? Okay, I know Craig's taken it a few steps past that with some in-house uh, software development. But, um, so here's one of the key takeaways from utilizing a CRM, and this might sound obvious, First of all, raise of hands. Who, how many in here are using a CRM? All right, that's probably 80%. But of course, this is the elite group. That's why you're here, right? So of this group, and if you raised your hand, how many of you ensure that 100% of your leads, every web form, every live chat, chat, phone call, trade show lead, social lead, pay-per-click lead, 100% of leads make their way into your CRM? Raise your hand. Okay, I appreciate the, the honesty. Uh, and I, I think that's accurate. I think that's a hard next step, but it's, it's a necessary next step. So here you can see the Guardian website. They have a form right on the front page of their website. This pipes directly into their CRM. And uh, I'm gonna ask Bill to speak. Bill was uh, very firm on this. Point. Yeah, we were uh, fortunate. We developed our CRM 25 years ago, and it resides in our mass operating system. So any way a lead comes into our company, whether it comes from the field, comes from the website, comes in through the phone, we not only track how that lead came in, because we use RCF numbers to track where the leads are coming in, but we, we also track why, because that's important to know why they called it. They might have got your number from the yard side, and you need to know that. They may have got your number out of the Yellow Pages. There's still some people that do that. It's surprising how many calls we get from Yellow Pages. But so you need to not only know how they got a hold of you, but why they're calling you. So a job can't be built in our system, can't be installed, unless it starts as a lead in CRM. And that gives us the ability to look at where we're spending our money and our return on the investment. So literally, we have a, a marketing cost for every sale in our company, regardless of how it comes in. So we know how to spend our money, and it might be a conversion issue, or it might be, um, you know, just there's more opportunities to spend I, money there. And I think it was, thank you, Bill, I appreciate that. It was consensus across uh, the, the folks that I spoke with that it is almost impossible to effectively manage a sales team if you don't, in fact, have all the data of leads and opportunities, and they're actually following up on those leads and opportunities, their close rates on those leads and opportunities, how can you effectively manage your team if you don't have visibility to that? And so that's another very clear and obvious benefit of implementing a CRM. Go paperless. Here's an example of a process. Form is entered on a website. Prospect record automatically created in your CRM. Salesperson is automatically assigned to that CRM or to that, uh, that lead, which is now prospect. That salesperson now tracks their proposal and their quoting to the customer. And they ultimately contract to get that contract to the customer without ever touching one piece of paper. That is one of the major benefits you can have by utilizing a CRM. And again, I'm going to ask Craig to stand up. Craig said, we went paperless to improve the customer experience. Additionally, our sales team loves the high-tech 
system resulting in their actually using it. When I, I've, I've been doing a bit of reading about this space and I've talked to some folks, there's, there seems to be an issue of training, uh, retaining, recruiting qualified salespeople to help you grow your team. And so in Craig's case, he actually found that when his recruits see this technology, they want to use it and it's resulted in a win-win for the customer and for you know, Craig's business. Yes, yeah, certainly as it pertains to customers, we think it is a real differentiator against somebody who may be quoting something on paper. And there are a lot of folks that still do that today. But the intangible pieces that we have seen from this are, I'll say two things. Number one, the backside efficiency. When a, when a job is committed at seven o'clock on a Tuesday night in someone's home or a small business, that job is immediately communicated into a queue so our operations folks have visibility to it, our branch administration folks have visibility to it, the credit queue, the general manager, all that planning begins automatically. So we, a lot of folks just view this as a customer perception thing, but we've seen really a, uh, an operational efficiency as a result of this, this type of step. The other thing, and, and what you touched on earlier, is really training for sales associates it really lets us cut down the ecosystem of products that are available. And it lets us be consistent in the products that we offer and help streamline that message to the consumers. So if it's something that we want to sell and make available to our clients, we can put it into our selling uh, tools. Uh, we can refine the messaging that goes along with that. And then really those iPad type tools become part of a training initiative for a new hire. So now your salespeople are on script selling exactly what you want them to sell, exactly the way you want them to sell. And that's, that's really impressive. All right, guys, that is the end of my talk. I've given you a free gift. I have a book on uh, the benefits of utilizing and how to use a CRM. It is on a table as you leave this room today. I hope I have enough. I have uh, approximately 100 or so out there. So feel free to grab it. Uh, it's written by an industry authority on CRM. It's no way tied to my business. It's just my gift to you guys. Uh, I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity. I am offering a free benefits to anyone that would like to take me up on it. I will give your company a free web uh, SEO audit and a free 30 point website checklist. So if you wanna go in and document whether your website is up to snuff, then uh, that is a location here on our website, onefirefly.com forward slash Total Tech Summit 16. That site is up live now. Give us your information and we'll, we'll take it from there. And John, I know I'm right at my marks. So I don't know you if we have it. time for you questions. No, I think we're, at, we're out of time for questions. Well, we, we could take one question. Anyone got one? No. Okay, well, today at this luncheon, we had the power of one. We had Ron with one firefly, who was our presenter. Let's hear it for Ron in his presentation. <laughs> and, we, and we had the power of one with a One Vision Resources and Joey Kolchinski, sponsor of this session. Let's hear it for Joey <laughs> and One Vision. And now to our uh, housekeeping. Um,